Hello class, we're going to pick up now chapter 32, this is part 3, and in this video we're going to take a look at the duties an agent owes uh, in the agency relationship. I have included each duty on the vocabulary list. Uh, I, I don't think they are terribly hard for you to learn, but I want to remind you, um, you know, please commit to um, learning, learning these uh, terms. All right, so uh, the four, maybe it's five, okay, uh, duties that an agent owes are first, uh, letter A here, duty of performance. That just means that an agent should use reasonable diligence and skill to complete the work that he's been asked to do by the principal. All right, second duty is the duty of obedience. Uh, the duty of, of obedience means the agent should follow instructions and do what the principals asked him to do, asked him or her to do. These two duties, um, they overlap. Sometimes it's a little hard to distinguish the difference between the duty to perform or the duty of performance and the duty of obedience. Um, uh, but um, when it comes time to test, I try to be really clear, uh, as clear as I can with you, and um, I uh, usually have a little room for you to uh, distinguish uh, or, or to um, choose between these two, all right? Um, whoops, let me see if I can advance the slide. Here we go. All right, our third uh, duty is the duty of notification. And uh, this means the agent needs to keep the principal informed, up to date uh, on the work, on the progress of the work. Uh, for example, uh, if there's fluctuation in prices, uh, that information should be relayed to the principal. If there are other factors that affect the situation or maybe negotiations, again, uh, the agent should tell the principal. Fourth duty uh, is the duty of loyalty. Uh, we've seen that before, right, with uh, partnerships, uh, with corporations. In, in this case, we're talking about an agent, though, so the agent has to act on behalf of the principal's interests, no one else's interests, the principal's interests. So here, the issues that come up would involve possibly self-dealing, all right, that's prohibited. Um, you know, many kind of making money uh, in contrast to securing the best deal for the principal, uh, that all would be prohibited by the duty of loyalty, by the exercise of the duty of loyalty. There is a case uh, in your book, it's 32.3, involves the company Taser International. And this is an example. In this case, we have an example of an agent who is in competition with his principal. So this is what happened. The defendant in this case is a Mr. Ward, and he was the VP of marketing at Taser. While he was still working for Taser, he began planning to leave and start his own company. He made a business plan, he consulted attorneys, and he considered manufacturing uh, an eyeglass mounted and a clip-on camera product. The defendant, Mr. Ward, he argues that none of his activities while he was still working for Taser were in conflict with Taser. However, when this went to trial, the, the court said that if the plaintiff was engaged, if Taser was engaged in the research of these products, then um, Mr. Ward's activities were in violation of his duty of loyalty, were in competition. Uh, with his employer at the time, the Taser Company, all right? Um, and so the, the appellate court um, uh, basically said that this case has to go back to the trial court for consideration of how involved the defendant, Mr. Ward, was in these activities, all right? So there, uh, anyway, that gives you a pretty clear um, picture of an employee agent in competition uh, with his employer and in violation then of the duty of loyalty. 
All right, and then here is our fifth and last duty. This is the duty of accounting. Um, it, that's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, if an agent comes into funds, property that belong to the principal, then the agent has an obligation to do an accounting of that, all right, um, to uh, indicate to their principal, you know, where all the funds are. All right. I'd like to take a look at a um, illustration now. It's one, again another case problem, and uh, this is case pro not case problem business scenario problem 32-2. So I'm going to close out of the PowerPoint, and we're going to toggle over to the Mind Tap. Uh, I want to stay signed in. Yes. All right. And so we're going to look at 32-2 right here all right so let me read this to you peter hires alice as an agent to sell a piece of property he owns the price is to be at least thirty thousand dollars alice discovers that the fair market value of peter's property is actually at least forty five thousand dollars and could be higher because a shopping mall is going to be built nearby alice forms a real estate partnership with her cousin carl then she prepares for Peter's signature a contract for the sale of the property to Carl for $32,000. Peter thinks, great, he signs the contract. Just before closing and passage of the title, however, Peter learns about the shopping mall and the increased market value of the property. Peter refuses to deed the property to Carl. Carl claims that Alice, as Peter's agent, solicited a price above that agreed on when the agency was created, and that the contract is therefore binding and enforceable. Discuss fully whether Peter is bound to this contract. All right, so think about this. Look at the facts again. All right, what do we know? Peter's the principal. Alice is the agent. Alice is hired to sell Peter's land. In order to determine whether Peter is bound to the contract, we're going to have to look at Alice's conduct. Right? Has she fulfilled the duties she owes to Peter? Well, she did sell the property. All right. So technically, you know, she has performed. All right. Um, and technically, you know, she has obeyed. All right. But what do we know here? Alice learned that the property is worth $45,000, not the $30,000 that Peter thinks, at least initially what Peter thought, okay? So what is Alice's duty in that case? She has a duty to tell Peter. She needs to fulfill her duty of notification. She fails to do that, all right? Um, additionally, all right, what is Alice thinking when she hears about the $45,000 value? She sees a big opportunity for herself. Um, she plans to go into business with her cousin Carl, uh, and instead of uh, Alice approaching Peter to buy the land, she is going to try to hide behind Carl, and Carl is going to make the deal to buy the land. And probably their plan is to buy it $32,000 and then resell it, right? Make a quick profit that way. Anyway, what duty is Alice violating here? when she goes off and has this side deal with her cousin Carl. She is violating the duty of loyalty because she's not putting Peter's interests first any longer. Uh, and even though Peter is making more than he expected, right, with the $32,000, he is not getting the benefit of Alice's knowledge of the market or the benefit of her service, which is why he hired her. All right. So, you know, Alice has now breached the duty of notification. She's breached the duty of loyalty. All right. And um, if this deal were to go through, you know, she still would benefit greatly. All right. That is not fair. All right. That's not the way the law works to benefit Alice for her wrongdoing. So while Peter has signed the contract, uh, and we have not yet learned um, this remedy, uh, what it's called yet, but he is not going to be bound, all right, to that contract that he signed. Um, when, uh, under circumstances where his agent Alice has acted improperly. So Peter is going to be able to walk away. All right, he's going to be able to basically cancel uh, this contract 
and not be uh, bound to uh, sell it or convey it to Carl. All right, so that uh, was a pretty short um, in terms of what we covered here. I'm going to switch back to the uh, PowerPoint. All right, and um, I'm going to be closing out of this part three, and I'll pick up with part four where we'll, we will um, finish the remaining section uh, sections of the chapter and um, take a look at a few new remedies at the end of the chapter.